We're going to begin today with a video clip, and uh, uh, I'm thanking the Lord again for our screens. Um, see if uh, you, well, you'll see what we're talking about here. We won't watch the whole thing. Trouble's my middle name. Ideas is my middle name. Danger is my middle name. Progress is his middle name. Mowing ass is my middle name. Gas can is my middle name. Well, that's cause that's my middle name. And Lake is mine. Honey, catering is my middle name. Hollow is my middle name. Trouble is my middle name. Danger is my middle name. Desperation is my middle name. <laughs> Stealth is my middle name. Trouble is actually my new middle name. Stick around, baby. Surprise is my middle name. My middle name is motherfucking. Faithful is my middle name. Ready's my middle name. What the hell? Thin's my middle name. It's my middle name. Compression. Honey, trouble is my middle name. Stupid is my middle name. <laughs> oh, no. You know what my middle name is? What? GPS. <gasps> Cooperation is my middle name. Okay, let's put it right there. Um, so what's the recurring phrase you heard? Yeah, something is my middle name. I didn't, I wasn't sure everybody knows that expression, but apparently in the movies, I thought I turned it on. Hey, back there, I got green. Is it working? Testing? Okay. John says okay. He's further back than you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, apparently it's one of the most frequently use phrases in the movies. I didn't know that when I started and came up with this title. Um, you know, the phrase is different from a nickname, right? A lot of times the son comes along, he has the same name as his dad, and we just call him Junior. Something cute. Uh, or when I was young, uh, my friends at school gave me the nickname Fisherman, because, well, I grew up with hand-me-downs, and so somewhere we got handed down to us a rain protection outfit, and the hat wasn't that nice yellow one that all the other kids were wearing. I had one that was the kind that the fisherman wore, you know, the ones with the long bill that covers the neck and all that. And so the kids thought it was funny, so they called me fisherman after that. Uh, anyway, this is not the same as a nickname. When people say something is my middle name, it says that you have some very distinctive characteristic. So George Lopez, in that last little clip, he is a scoutmaster, and he's leading all these Girl Scouts into the woods. And they're wondering if he knows where he's going. And so to reassure them, he says, GPS is my middle name. Well, you know, most guys get lost really quick, right? And we don't ask for directions. So for him to make that bold assertion is something. So let me ask you, think about yourself. If you were to introduce yourself and say, blank is my middle name, what would it be? Do you have something that you can say, you know? Ready is my middle name, okay? Helpful is my middle name. Uh, true is my middle name. I'm trying to think of some examples that might apply to you. Can you think of one for yourself? If you haven't been able to come up with one really easily, let me give you one. Based on the title of today's message, what can be, what should be our middle name? Love. Love should be our middle name. Love should be our defining characteristic. 
God has a middle name. What's his middle name? Well, those of you who know John, 1 John 4, 16, we have that phrase. God is love. Right? He has a lot of names in the Old Testament. He is more than love. But he makes this statement that I am love. God is love. And so in a sense, that is his middle name, one of his middle names. And three verses later, we have that wonderful statement where it says, we love because he first loved us. And so, again, in following suit with God, love should be our middle name as well. That should be our defining characteristic. And so we're going to be starting a new series this week. And my general title or um, heading for it is Effective Love. We're not just going to be talking about the word love, certainly not in the abstract or as an ideal, but to learn how to concretely and therefore effectively love others. Okay? And that way we can say love has become our middle name. Um, we don't want to be what is described in the Bible as being able to do so many things and then miss the most important thing which is love. We said two weeks ago that church is our boot camp. This is where we learn all this stuff. And so in the church, one of the first things we want to learn in learning to be like God is to learn to love like God. And the church is the best place for learning to practice this. We're going to be focusing because there's so many things we can do to express love, but we're going to focus on uh, five specific ways. Uh, this is brought out in a book that some of you may know, some of you may have even read. It's written by Dr. Gary Chapman, who is a, a noted um, Christian counselor. And he noticed after decades of working with people, that there are five very dominant channels of expressing love. And they're very practical. And they really nurture people. And so to just kind of get control of the many possibilities and to hit on the most important ones, we're going to be basing it on those five love languages and use those uh, as means of building up our personal skill in being loving. And here's the deal and the value of focusing on these five. If my love language is A or number one, but let's say Silda's love language is number three. If I'm showing her and expressing love language number one, what do you think is it going to be really beneficial to her since her love language is number three? No. What I need to do is be able to identify her love language and learn to speak number three to her. You see? And so this is how practical it becomes. Um, <clears throat> so this is what we're going to be doing. But as a foundation, before Gary Chapman ever came along, God spoke extensively about love. And so today, we're going to lay a foundation by going to that famous love chapter in the Bible. Where's that? Yeah, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All right? And this is so famous, and you hear it at all the weddings. And so... Um, Basically, what it is, is chapter 13, usually people mention it, but they never 
give the context. And the context is this. The church people at Corinth were having a lot of disputes with one another. I mean, it wasn't all out war, but there was a lot of division, a lot of trumping one another, a lot of seeking the higher ground, a lot of showing off their abilities, and there was a lot of pride going on. And so Paul is addressing this for several chapters. And he's especially uh, talking about their spiritual gifts becoming a point of division. And in the middle of all this, he says, you know what? Let me tell you something. There's something much better than these spiritual gifts that you guys so prize. So much better than your abilities uh, that you're flaunting, you know. And so he comes to arguing for love. And chapter 13 is what the, the teachers in seminary who teach preaching call a persuasive sermon. He's not just talking about love in the abstract, but he's trying to persuade the Corinthian Christians to take on this as their primary characteristic. He say, Corinthian believers, love is your middle name. So let's get you practicing love all the time. And so this is the background to what's going on here. And we're going to cover it section by section. I was going to go through the whole chapter, but uh, that turned out to be way too long. And so we're only going to cover the first half of it. Okay? And the first half, first paragraph of it, I would summarize this way. That love is always to be our defining characteristic as believers. Or as I've been saying, love is to be our middle name. That regardless of which expression, which love language we use, uh, however we want to show our love, Love should be clear. Love should be easily identified. And so this is the first of three comparisons he's going to make in 1 Corinthians 13 to say that this is the best and other things are much less. And so um, in the previous chapter, verse 31 of chapter 12, he finishes off by saying, so, okay, earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. See? So he's saying, you know, there is a whole other category beyond giftedness, and it is the way of love. And uh, so, anyway, that's the lead in. Now, let's see as he compares love and spiritual gifts, all right? Let's read verses 1, 2, and 3 together. Um, and we'll read it in unison. If I speak altogether out loud, continue. One more. Did you notice how many times he uses the word all? I mean, he is saying, these are your most spectacular gifts being expressed at the highest levels. But if I don't have love, he goes all the way from all down to nothing. Quite a comparison, quite a slam dunk against the Corinthians for thinking about their greatness and their achievements and their success. He says, 
You know, you can do something extraordinarily loving and yet somehow still do it without love. Let me share with you how I've reduced these three verses in a way that is valuable to me. First, loving is more important than doing. Okay? I mean, the people here in these three verses with their, their great gifts, they have the ability to do spectacular things. But, you know, if you're not loving, then if that's not what's driving your doing, then doing it doesn't really end up in true loving. In fact, it's a very practical thing. You know, if you're doing things for people, but you're not doing with love, you know what happens? I've seen over and over. We get resentful. We start to say, why don't you appreciate what I'm doing? My efforts, my sacrifice, my sweat. And, you know, first it's irritating, but over time, it can be so much um, of a hurtful thing to the one who's trying to do these things that we will stop doing it. And so it's important for us, therefore, to have that love going and going and being the driving force. So in the church, which is a serving community, and we should be, always remember, the loving should be an integral part of it. It should be a driving part of it. Uh, in fact, you know, that's why, as a Christian, I would never be without a church. A church where there are people different from me. Because if I'm not having to rub elbows with people who are different from me, guess what? Love is falling off a log. Love is easy. But I'm dealing with people who are different from me. Then love gets developed. Now, there are certain people in this church I know my natural style could drive them crazy. Okay? They are the people who are very detailed and very careful and have everything thought through. I like to go by inspiration. That means to you, maybe sloppy. To me, always changing my path. Always looking for something better. You know, uh, not so orderly and structured. Well, guess what? When that person demands that I told the line, I'm going to have to be tolerant and be compliant and do it a way that's harder for me and not natural for me. And I will have to learn to love, not just obey. Because if I'm just obeying, I could be building up that resentment I was talking about. But if I do it because I want to bless that person, that I want to help that person to get their job done so that that person can have pleasure in that person's area of service, you see, then I'm being loving. And so it's good for us to find these people who are different. Otherwise, you know, my love muscles would just turn to fat. And I don't want it to have that going on. And so that's something we call body life. Now, secondly, I reduce these three verses down to this idea that love is the essential ingredient. I don't know if they still teach this in the first year of college in the psych first semester course, but I still remember reading about those orphanages where the nurses were too busy. They had too many kids. So all they could do was manage to come in and provide food 
and change the diaper for the kids. And they found that the babies were dying at an alarming rate for some reason. And as they investigated the matter, you know what they found out? They weren't, but specifically, Perry, they weren't getting cuddling. And by they not getting that tactile sensation, skin to skin, body to body warmth, even though they were being fed and watched over and the right medicines were given, they were dying. The power of love and the need for love. But you know, that's also true even as an adult. I've been treated by some doctors who didn't care who I was. They saw me as a source of revenue or they saw me as, as, as a, a subject, I was going to say victim, as a subject for the medical skills, right? They come in and they treat you just kind of like an inanimate object that they're here to manipulate. They have no bedside manner. They have no communication. You have no rapport with them. And you're feeling the same thing as an adult that those little children felt. You need to have that kind of nourishment. Um, John Maxwell said it in such a way that I have never forgotten. He said, talking to pastors, he says, they don't care, meaning the congregation, they don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Same thing with our kids. Same thing with our students. Same thing with our patients. Um, and so, uh, anyway, it's something that is an essential ingredient. And so, just a clarification, in this passage, we're not talking about love for God. We're talking about love for one another. And First John says, the only way you prove your love for me is by showing your love to what? To one another. If you can't show it to somebody tangible, how do you show it to somebody who is a spirit? And I find that to be so true. I mean, men, right? We have trouble talking making long conversation. And so when, when men are asked to pray, it gets doubly hard because you've got to make conversation to someone who's not carrying his end of the load. You can't see him. You know, it becomes very difficult. And so, again, we need to be thinking about one another. I have seen so many people who love God and they've gone to seminary. And when they graduated, they went to work in a church. And it hurt them, and it hurt their people. When they should have just stayed in seminary and been professors, because their love was for the Bible. Their love was for God. But they hadn't developed that other dimension of love for their flock. And Jesus is what? The shepherd does what for his sheep? Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about pretty heavy-hitting love here. And so this is the essential ingredient. Now, let's look at the next paragraph. And this one is only four verses. And once again, I'm going to ask you to read. But basically, what this is saying is something I find wonderfully liberating, and helpful. What it's saying is that love is always to be expressed because guess what? Love always can be expressed. And I'll explain to you what I mean. So stay together, read the next four verses while I drink some of my Chinese medicine. <laughs>
Continue. Now, I sat in so many wedding ceremonies, and, you know, finally one day it struck me. Love is patient. Love is kind. And I thought about it, and I said, why does this sound so ordinary? So white bread, so plain vanilla. I mean, I, when I thought about it, okay, let me show you an example of the great example of love that I learned in high school. And I'm not talking about my first infatuation, okay? Um, there was a period in literature called the Romantic Period. And they had a bunch of poets. And one of the great romance poets, her name was Elizabeth Barrett Browning. You guys have to read Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Yeah, some of you did, right? And so the famous first line of her poem goes like this. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And most of us guys will say, uh, one. <laughs> okay? And she's going on. She says, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach when feeling out of sight. For the ends of being an ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Whew. Man, that was like a rocket, right? Straight into the orbit. Love is patient. Love is kind. I mean, you can almost pick any country western song and the things they say about love will be far more dramatic than these four verses. And so you think about it and you say, huh, God, you could have done better than Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So why? Why is it like this? Why is it so seemingly mundane? And I think what God is saying is that love can always be present and a part of our lives. We don't have to have some grand gesture of love, giving all that I have away or giving my body to be burned in order to be loving. And what it does is it separates out actions that are specifically loving from just being loving Possibly always. Right? We're loving, guys, once a year. Which day is that? Valentine's Day, right? And you go and get her that 50-pound box of chocolates, right? A grand gesture of love. I mean, it's easy to think in those terms. But God is calling for something quite a bit different to have love as a constant ingredient to anything that's going on in our lives. You know, yesterday after the film showing, we were having fellowship. And I was talking to a rabbi who was in the film, and we were talking about a person who doesn't come to this church that I'm working with and helping him through family problems. And he immediately took my project, my concern, my care upon his own shoulders. 
He says, you know, Pastor, if I can help you with that in any way. And not only did he offer help, but he immediately prayed with me for that person and for the hope of restoring a grandfather to his daughter and to the grandson. You know, love can always be there. It doesn't have to be some grand thing that we do. It's something we put into everything. One of the guys on my worship team He was a foodie. He loved to eat. He loved to discover new foods. And one day he discovered that amazing, weird Filipino favorite, banana ketchup. Yeah, I know. Some of you go, what? what, what, what? Did he say banana ketchup? Yeah, banana ketchup. All right. So Scott took that banana ketchup and he didn't just put it on his meat. He put on his cereal. He mixed it with his milk. <laughs> Read of his making faces. But you see, read them. Scott fell in love with banana ketchup. Okay? And it became an ingredient in everything he would eat. Now that is outrageous. But putting various versions of love into everything that goes on in our lives is not far-fetched at all. I remember one day I was having some watermelon and my dad suggested that I sprinkle a little what? Salt. Salt on it. I thought, what? Salt? This is supposed to be sweet and you want me to put something salty on it? But all of you ladies know, right? Salt is a universal ingredient. If you cook something and you forget to put in a little salt, doesn't quite taste the same because salt brings out the flavor in everything. And that's what love does. And that's why it's so effective. And you can use it universally. And God says, who is to be the salt of the earth? We are to be the salt of the earth. And so if we are expressing his love, everywhere, then it is effective. And so I think that's why we have these 15 descriptions of love and sounding so ordinary. Love is patient. You got a little toddler at home and he's learning to tie his shoelaces. And you want to get moving. And he insists that he can tie his own shoelace. And you know that he's going to make a knot. And later on, you're going to spend 10 minutes untying the knot. And it would take you five seconds to do his shoelaces for him. But love is patient. You let him learn how to tie his shoelaces. Love is kind. My wife loves mushrooms. So whenever we're eating, I take my mushrooms and I give her my mushrooms. I like mushrooms, but she likes mushrooms more. Right? So I give her my best mushrooms. And I eat the shriveled up looking ones. You see? So love can always be a part of the process of life. When we take it from those grand gestures that happen once in a while to becoming something that can be truly 24-7. You're sleeping in bed, and your spouse starts to snore. You've got two options. You kick your spouse out of bed, or you go by earplugs. Which one is the loving way to behave? Okay, see, it's not that hard when you reduce it down to these kind of terms. And you know, We're going to have to wrap up. But did you notice that sandwich between a few positives and a few more at the end were all these negative things? What's with that? Isn't love about what we should do? No. God says sometimes what we don't do 
is loving. Guys, what would a woman not do to be loving? Hey, right? You see, that wasn't so hard. There's all kinds of things where if we stop doing it, we are expressing love. This is so practical. And we think about these things and we can come up with so many things. I hear men making jokes about their wives, right? The wife brings in the dinner and you go, I thought I smelled burnt offering coming from the kitchen. You know, and she spent all day on this day. She might have been a woman who grew up being wealthy and not knowing how to boil water. Right? There's women like that. And you make these things, and you think it's funny, and inside her soul shrivels up. You don't have to say that. Instead, you can eat it with a smile. So, very, very practical. Well, we're coming to the end um, because of time. Uh, But the point of all this, like I said, is this is a sermon calling people to make love the priority. But not just a priority in some theoretical sense, but make it a constant in our lives. A constant. When I say constant, when does it happen? All the time. Constantly. And so that's what he's challenging us to do. And so as we go through this, I want us to think, you know, will we ask God to make this a priority in our lives? Will we take this and make it the high priority, not just in theory, not just as something we talk about, but in practicality, in reality. And if we do, which one of these positive things would you like to focus in on? Or maybe you need to focus in on some negative things. You know, when I grew up as an immigrant and as a chubby kid, and a bunch of other handicaps, I got picked on a lot at school, okay? And so I developed a bully's attitude and a lifestyle. And so I, being chubby, was bigger than a lot of the kids. So it was easy for me to bully them. And so the second half of my teen years was getting rid of the negative. You see how that works? And maybe that happened to you, that you acquired a lot of these negative characteristics that are so hurtful to your spouse, to your parents, to your kids, to your uh, uh, lab partner, whoever. So some of us may want to focus on the positives. Some of us may want to focus on the negatives. Some of you may latch on and clarify your own personal love language And you're going to say, this is what I want to do. Others of you are going to say, I want to know my partner's love language. And I want to get good at that because that's so different from my love language. Uh, Cameron, did we get that closing video? I want you to hear this song from the 70s where it, it just has a wonderful way of bringing this whole message of 1 Corinthians 13 into song. Although I speak with tongues of men and of angels, And though I prophesy and understand all Although I have a faith so mountains may be removed And though I feed the poor and give up my life 
If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me, I am nothing. Jesus reduce me to love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not envious, not proud, but gentle and meek, seeks not her own way. Love sings when Jesus prevails, believes and endures all things. Love hopes and love bears every wrong. And love never fails. If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me, I am nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. One season. I was a child. I spoke and I thought as a child. But when I turned to a man, such ways put aside. Though now we see through a glass, but then we shall see face to face. Though now abides faith and hope. The greatest is love. If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me, I am nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me. I am nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. Jesus, reduce me to love. Isn't that a great closing line? This uh, song summarizes the whole chapter, First Corinthians thirteen. And it's called charity, and that's the old King James word for agape love. And that's why it's called charity. So, and may that be our prayer as we go through this series, that closing line, Jesus, reduce me to love. Let's pray. Lord, we remember that story of the difference between heaven and hell where the ones in hell starve because not being able to feed themselves, they won't feed one another. And heaven instead being the place where we feed one another when we cannot feed ourselves and we are all abundantly well fed. And so make that to be the situation for us as a congregation that we will seek to be those who give love rather than demand love. And as we give love and as everyone gives love, we would be filled with love. So bless us with clarity of insight on our needs, but also on our strengths, so that we may offer it in love and we may become skilled in effective loving. So be with your people and transform us so that love becomes accurately our middle name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.